Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day. Uh, today is Dress Down Father's Day. Uh, in service, we're wearing shorts. Eating during service, we're, we're really pushing the envelope here. Uh, but go ahead, uh, crack over those chips, eat, have a good time. Uh, let's snack uh, together. As, as you enjoy yours, I will enjoy mine. Mm. I'll come back to it. As we think about fathers and Father's Day, perhaps a lot of emotions, a lot of thoughts may come to mind. Uh, we think about God, our Heavenly Father, the God who is perfect, who is just, the one who is true, God who is our standard. And as well, we might have joy as we think about our earthly fathers, our earthly fathers who have portrayed that love of God the Father, our earthly fathers who have given us a glimpse of who God is through our interaction with them. We have joyful memories of our interactions with our fathers, but at the same time, perhaps for Father's Day, it might be a time of sorrow and mourning. It may be a time of grief. Perhaps during Father's Day and other days, as we think about our fathers, perhaps we think about loss, we think about hurt, Oh, it's good that we don't eat every day. Oh, thanks. Perhaps it's sad as well as we think about fathers because of hurt, because of harm that has been done, because of maybe physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual scars that have been left behind. Perhaps we're hurt because of unmet expectations whether you as a father who has had a father and who has kids, or perhaps for some of us who have experienced a father or are looking to one day become fathers ourselves. When it comes to Father's Day and thinking about fathers, what do you think about and how do you feel? When I think about my father, uh, not my heavenly father, but my earthly father, my father who are in Florida, uh, Joseph be his name, I think about his characteristics, and one thing that stands out is his devotion, his commitment to provide and protect for his family. I remember when I was in middle school, uh, being in sixth grade, just trying to get through those crowded hallways, all those humongous and huge upperclassmen, and just bumping into them, hoping that I can get to one class to the next. There was one day as I was bumping around in the hallways, I accidentally ran into another boy much larger than me. I accidentally knocked over his books. He stopped, he turned, and he kicked me in, he kicked me in the leg. <laughs> it hurt. I thought nothing of it. I went to class. I got home, and by that time, this huge bruise had formed on my shin. My mom saw the bruise, asked me what had happened. I told her what happened. She was so upset. A few hours later, my dad comes home from work. He sees the bruise on my leg. He asks me what happened. I tell him what happened. Oh, he is infuriated. Protection, provide, dad mode, kicks into gear. He's so upset, in fact, that he immediately gets up, grabs the phone, dials the phone, and calls my Sunday school teacher. Now, why would he be so upset as to call my Sunday school teacher? My Sunday school teacher was also my middle school principal. Ah, there you go. Right. The next day, I get called into the principal's office. My principal slash Sunday school teacher asked me, do you know who did this to you? I told her, I don't know his name, but I can point him out for you. So along with her, we go out to the hallway, that crowded hallway. But this time, no one was bumping into us. I stood right next to her scanning the hallway, people just like parting the Red Sea, just walking around us. When I think about my father, his will, his desire to do anything possible to provide and protect for his sons. But the reality is, for every story of how my father called the SWAT team to protect his sons, there are countless other stories of how my father failed to provide my every and all need. 
For every time he tried his hardest, there were countless accounts and stories of how he fell way short. There were times when he provided financially, working long hours. But then I said, Dad, I just want to see you more. And there's other times and seasons when I saw my dad a lot, and I just told him, Dad, can you go make more money? There's stuff I want from you. There's emotional things that maybe as guys we could just never get around to talking about. Even to this day, there are scars and wounds that I know that I need to deal with to forgive him of, and vice versa, to ask him for my forgiveness. Even as he gets older and more limited in his old age, I know that I need to stop asking him to provide, protect. Dad, give me more. Now, if anything, if not sooner than later, I need to protect, provide for him. The question I want to pose to our fathers this morning, to those who will be fathers one day, in reality, to everyone here, the question is this. Who are you trying to provide for? Who are you trying to be an all in all, an everything, all sufficient? Who are you trying to satisfy wholly in your life? And vice versa, who are you looking to satisfy you? On whose shoulders have you placed the requirements, the demands? Dad, mom, friend, hey, you, I expect you to be my all in all, my everything. I expect you to satisfy my every need to make me whole and complete. Who are you expecting that from this morning? This morning, we'll answer and see three things in particular, a problem, solution, and an application. A problem, solution, and an application. What is the problem we encounter when we try to be someone's all in all? What is the problem we encounter when we try to provide and protect wholly and fully for others in our lives? What is the solution to that problem and application, what we are to do today and each and every day of our lives, according to the scriptures. If you would please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. This morning we're going to be verses 13 through 21. Matthew 14, 13 through 21. You can find Matthew in the New Testament towards the right hand side of your Bibles, Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Keep going to your right. Books of poetry, keep going. Past Malachi, you'll hit Matthew. If you mark Luke, John, Acts, Romans, you've gone too far. Matthew 13, 14, and we'll be in 13 through 21 this morning. Last week, we made our way through Matthew chapter 13, and we saw the significance of that chapter. As Jesus is traveling and teaching with his disciples, performing miracles and healing, in chapter 13, that is the first time in the Gospel of Matthew that we see Jesus use the tool of his parables. He tells seven parables, instructing his disciples, foretelling of his future death, resurrection, and departure, and thus giving his disciple, his followers, instruction of what they are to do when he is gone. Instruction of the ministry that they are to continue. In chapter 14, we see a continuation of this instruction of what their earthly ministry is to look like while Jesus is there and after he is gone. In chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, it begins with the death of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is beheaded. John the Baptist's disciples bury John the Baptist, and they go and they report to Jesus what has occurred. We pick up after Jesus hearing the news of John the Baptist's death, 13 through 17. Now when Jesus heard this, that is, hearing of John the Baptist's death, Jesus withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. 
The disciples said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. We see here in the text that Jesus withdraws to a desolate place to mourn the loss of John the Baptist. This great crowd follows them. In verse 21, we get a sense of the size of this crowd. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. And so including women and children, some estimates run around 15 to 1,020 people. In this desolate place, Jesus has compassion for the people, and he heals their sick. But as the story progresses, it is getting late. The disciples see that it's getting late. And so what do they ask and tell of Jesus? They tell Jesus what? Send them away. The disciples, this is not a cruel or unusual request. It's not one that lacks compassion. Uh, They're just thinking logically. They're just planning ahead. They're seeing that it is getting late. It is a desolate place. There's nothing to eat. And so these people are going to get hungry. Let's do the right thing. And let's tell them to go and send them out to the villages so they can go buy things for themselves. But what is Jesus' response? 16, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Jesus instructs his disciples to provide for them, knowing well that they cannot. All they have, what? We only have five loaves here and two fish. The disciples, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. They see the great need that is there. They need to f- feed 5, 10, 15, 20,000 people. Send them away. But Jesus says, no, you feed them. A problem that disciples face and a problem that we face is we seek to minister and to provide for others. We see that there is unlimited need. However, we only have limited resources to give. A problem that we all face is that we have an unlimited need. That as we look around us, there's unlimited need around us. Everybody needs something from us. There's countless of people to care for, to look after in our families, in our neighbors, in our neighborhoods, our schools, our workplaces. Perhaps this morning you're already plenty tired. You didn't need me to remind you that, man. There's unlimited need out there, and the problem is we are limited and incapable of meeting all those needs. In Lord of the Rings, I think Bilbo Baggins put it well, I feel thin, stretched, like butter scraped over too much bread. We all have the problem when we try to care for and provide for others. The problem is we soon realize there's unlimited need and we are limited in what we can provide. When I was young, something that I used to do to my friends, if, if I saw them eating a bag of chips, if my friends were just enjoying themselves eating a bag of chips, uh, I would take that bag of chips and... Yeah, I was that guy. Sorry. What a good friend, huh? Here you go, buddy. My friends, in disbelief, would ask me, what are you doing? With a huge smile, I would tell them, I'm giving you more chips. Get it? One becomes two, becomes four. You're welcome. I'm giving them more chips. You think that they would be happy, that they would be thankful, that they would be grateful. I am doing them a favor. I am giving them more chips. But what is their response? What would your response be? If anything... 
You're not giving me more chips. It was the same amount of chips. You just made it smaller. If, if anything, the small things that you're giving me, that is less satisfying. I don't want little crumbs. As we see the great need around us, and we think about all those people in our lives who need from us, who are trying to provide and love and care for. And so we realize, what do we do? We crumple our chips, right? I know what I'll do. There's so many people here who need me, who need my help. There's work, there's school, there's family, there's me time, there's husband, there's wife time, there's children time. I know what I'll do. I'm going to make more time. I'm going to split myself into smaller pieces and I'm going to give everyone a little small piece. So here, son, this is for you, wife, Mom, dad, school, you're welcome. Right. Boss, you're welcome. And we think to ourselves, and what inevitably happens as we try to make more time for more people? More people get unsatisfied, dissatisfied with the love and care that we're giving them. All they want is even more attention, more time, and more need. Because the reality is we only have so much time to begin with. No matter how small you divide it up, you're not creating more time. You're just making less for everybody else. For you, for me this morning, can we consider how small have we divided our time into? As we have sought to make more time for more people, just making more people less satisfied with the less time and resources, energy that we are giving them. Truly, like disciples here, we're stuck in a hard place. We're trying to feed 20,000 mouths emotionally, physically, spiritually, but at the same time, we can't leave them. A problem that we all face is that there is an unlimited amount of need out there, and yet we are limited in what we can provide for others. So what is the solution. Jesus tells them, do not turn them away. Feed them. He is telling them, knowing full and well that they cannot provide for all these people. They do not have enough time, energy, or resources to do so. So Jesus is waking them up, making them aware that yes, they are limited, and so they are to still provide for them, but how? Verse 17, the disciples said, we have only five loaves here and two fish, 18. And he said to them, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and two fish, he put them in a bag and just started to, no, no, no. He ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. Christ doesn't split the fish up. He doesn't split the bread up, but he multiplies, providing sufficiently. It is Jesus who provides for the crowd so that they have not only enough, so that they're made whole, so that they are full, but so that their cup runneth over, so that there is plenty of leftovers that remain. As we seek to provide the needs of others, our goal and our solution is not to seek to be the all in all for everybody around us. The answer to providing for others in our lives is not to continuously and endingly to give more, expecting that the other person will one day be satisfied with and through us. But the solution there, when we realize that we are limited and there is an unlimited need, 
The solution is verse 18. And he said to them, bring them here to me. How do we provide for the unlimited need that is out there? The way that we provide provision and protection for those around us is to not seek to be the provider, but instead to bring others to the one who can provide. Our job is not to be the all in all for others, but to bring them to the one who is. Our job is not to save our neighbors, to save our family, to save our coworkers. Our job is not to save New York, it's not to save India, it's not to save the world. But our job is to bring them, to introduce them to the one who can, Jesus Christ. A problem that we all face in our lives is that we realize that there's unmet, unlimited physical, emotional, spiritual need all around us. And the problem with that is that we realize that we are so limited and incapable of providing all those needs. So the solution is not stop caring. It is not cut people out. It is not just focus on yourself and ignore people. But as you realize and as you are overwhelmed with all the need that is out there, may your focus, may my focus be to point them to the one they can depend on, and that is Jesus Christ. So our application this morning is this. What are we to look for? How are we to know that we are involved in a ministry, involved in a relationship that is bringing people to Christ? How do we know that we are doing verse 18 in our lives? I was listening to, watching a video article about sound engineering, uh, about sound engineers and the science of sound. And, and they first they talked about the science of making things quieter. With improving technology, they, manufacturers have been able to make things it's more streamlined, more quiet, less noticeable. And certainly there are certain things in life that we want to make quieter. But they also talk about sound engineering and purposely making things louder and more noticeable. They talked about cars nowadays, vehicles, cars, trucks, whatever it might be. They've made it so well to insulate the outside noise that the car cabins are now so quiet. You can't hear the soft engine. You can't hear the outside noise. And so sound engineers have purposely made sports cars louder inside. They've artificially piped in through the speaker's engine noise because you want to hear, you want to feel like the thing is working. They also talked about vacuum cleaners. They said vacuum cleaners, there's no reason they need to be so loud. They make them loud on purpose. They want you to hear the whirling wind so you feel the cleaning power. In fact, sound engineers have talked about they've specifically tailored it and engineered it so that when the dust and dirt particles, you know that satisfying crinkling? Oh, that's not an accident, right? You need to hear that so you know that the vacuum cleaner is working. As we're ministering and involved with people in our lives, as we're loving and caring, what what sound, what should you hear to let you know it's working? What are you listening for to tell if you are providing for the people who need provision in your life? What should get louder over time, what you should hear more and more is the centrality of Christ and the relationship of those you are caring for. What should get louder and louder in your mission, as you encounter the need around you, what should get louder and louder in your relationships at home is verse 18. Over and over in your mind, what? My goal is to, verse 18, bring them to Christ. You encounter someone with a crisis. Yes, meet their physical need, emotional need, spiritual need. Meet them then and there. Rejoice with them, mourn with them, but in your mind, what should be whirling, 
Bring them to Christ. Bring them to Christ. Are you providing and protecting those around you? The short answer is, are you bringing them to Christ? For our fathers, the relationship with your children, what does it sound like early on? Perhaps early on, it sounds like diaper changes. It sounds like a lot of crying. It sounds like teaching them ABCs. It sounds like discipline. But how do you know that you're providing for your children? Verse 18 should start getting louder. The centrality of Christ should get louder as you grow and mature and develop with your family. The goal of the relationship as parents is not so that your children wholly depend on you. The goal is not so that we look up to our father and mother and think to ourselves, you are my everything. You are my all in all. No. The goal at the end is that through you, they know how to depend on the one who can provide their all in all, and that is Jesus Christ. As you spend time with your family, make sure that you witness them. Proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Lead them to the one who provides. For all of us, however your relationship may start, you know that you are providing, protecting for them when the centrality of Christ takes center stage and becomes louder and louder. The beginning of the relationship at work or at school may begin with the noise and the whirling about how to provide work and school. But the goal of the relationship isn't so that your coworker thinks to themselves, man, I can really depend on them for work. Man, I can really depend on you to get my homework done. But as the relationship develops, verse 18, bring them to Christ. May they be pointed to the one who can truly provide their all in all, Jesus Christ. Can you move your relationships from talking about school and work to talk more about the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ? For those who are providing and caring for others, provide and care by pointing them to Jesus Christ. Perhaps there are those here this morning who are wounded, who feel weak. Maybe you're in a season of life where you are depending on others to pour into you. And I hope and I praise God that there are fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that can come around you to care for you, to pray for you, just to eat with you, to snack with you, to just listen, to just be near you. But as gently as I can say this, as you spend more time with those who are caring for you, do not expect that other person to be your all in all. Do not expect them to fulfill you, to wholly satisfy you, because what would inevitably happen is this. You'll just need more of them and more of them. And you'll find yourself less and less satisfied, needing more and more. And inevitably, you'll get upset at them because why aren't you giving me more time? Why aren't you doing the things I need? Why aren't you satisfying and making me whole? In your own time, as you seek healing and restoration, may that conversation begin to steer towards Jesus Christ being your provider and you're all in all. For those involved with so many things in life, in ministry and things, and you feel like you are a crumpled bag of chips just giving everyone a small piece, perhaps there is wisdom in peeling back and honing in and finding focus. But make sure that as you find your focus, as you peel back, maybe you think to yourself, okay, Maybe I need to say no to all these things so I can spend more time with my significant other. But make sure as you spend more time with that other person, you're not thinking to yourself, I'm going to spend more time so I can provide all in all for that person. No. Even if your focus is on one thing, on one person, we're still insufficient. And it still must be focused on the centrality of Christ. Proclaiming the gospel Letting them know that, hey, I'm just a stopgap. I can't help you all the way. But I know someone who can. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning, for an opportunity for us today, but each and every day, to celebrate our fathers. May we celebrate you as our Heavenly Father. I thank you. Because of you, we can know what love is. I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for, as a good father, your discipline. I thank you for providing our each and every need, for giving us hope today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Heavenly Father, I lift up our fathers this morning. I pray and ask that you give them wisdom, that you guide them. That as the head of the household, as the one who has been given that awesome responsibility to lead and to lead well, I ask that you give them wisdom, give them humility. And as well, for all of us as children who have or have had fathers, we ask that you would allow us to know how to support them, how to love on them, how to care for them. For those of us this morning who find it with great joy to remember, to think about, and to relate with our fathers, I thank you for that joy. But as well for those this morning that the thought of fatherhood, at the thought of fathers or being a father, that that is met with great grief or sorrow or heartache, I pray for healing and restoration. That we may confess our sins to one another, that we may ask for forgiveness, that we may let go and surrender those heartaches. Not so that our fathers, not so that our children can heal us and restore us, but so that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can make us whole. Heavenly Father, I thank you for so many things that are going on in our lives. And I pray and I ask that we would be overwhelmed with the unmet needs that we encounter. That we'd be overwhelmed so that we're humbled to realize that we cannot be the all in all. And when we realize that, may it be a good reminder for us to point others to the one who can truly provide. I pray and I ask that we be faithful to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. That in each and every relationship, we will be bold to proclaim and to tell others of the hope that we have in you. I thank you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.